just ahead on American Black Journal. We have a special show for you on the life and legacy of Muhammad Ali and the sport of boxing here in Detroit. We're going to talk about the life lessons taught here at the downtown boxing gym, and we'll look at Detroit's historic boxing roots, plus a preview of Ken Burns' new PBS documentary on Muhammad Ali. Look at us back out in the world. You don't want to miss this show, so stay right there. American Black Journal starts now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal, partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, Impact at Home, UAW Solidarity Forever, and viewers like you, thank you. American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson, and as always, thanks for joining us. We're coming to you from the downtown boxing gym in Detroit, and today we are devoting our entire show to the sport of boxing and to the legacy of the man who was one of the most celebrated athletes of all time, Muhammad Ali. It's been five years since we lost the world heavyweight boxing champion who famously called himself the greatest. Ali's life is the subject of a new four-part PBS documentary series, which begins on September 19th by award-winning filmmaker Ken Burns. Muhammad Ali was an activist who fought to move America in a certain way. I have too much to fight for, cause to fight for. There was going to be an enormous price to pay for that. Boxing was this much of his evolution. The person he is today is way bigger. The price of freedom comes high. I have paid, but I am free. Muhammad Ali. Only on PBS. Of course, Detroit has its own rich history in the sport of boxing. The city has produced numerous champions, Joe Lewis, Thomas Hearns, and Hilmer Kenty, just to name a few. From the famous Kronk Gym to the city's Golden Gloves tournament, Detroit has always been a training ground for some of the best amateur and professional boxers around. Producer Marcus Green reports on the city's celebrated boxing scene. and made me very happy to, to be from the Detroit Cup because Detroit supported me so well. I couldn't do, I, I couldn't do no more win because I love the feel, I love the, I love the, the feel, I love the emotion that, that, that Detroit put into everything for me. And they showed me how to, what it was like to be a champion in Detroit. And once I learned what it was like to be a champion in Detroit, it's just a wonderful thing, a great feeling. So I didn't really know that much about boxing except for Muhammad Ali, because when I started high school, he won the Olympics. He got the gold medal in 1960. So that's what got me aware of boxing as a sport. I followed his career because I thought he was so interesting. And then when I got involved myself in boxing, working with Tommy Hearns and the Kronk Gym, in 1978, I was impressed at how much I thought Thomas Hearns reminded me of Muhammad Ali. His slick moves, his dominance in the ring, his personality, although he wasn't making up poems and rhymes, I could see a similarity in their greatness. You just see greatness in certain people. And so, as it turned out, unbeknownst to me, we would all be coming together in the early 80s because Muhammad Ali owned a company called MAPS, which was Muhammad Ali Professional Sports. And they ended up promoting some of Tommy Hearns' fights, his title fights. And so 
I finally got to meet this amazing man. I was writing for a daily paper as a journalist, and I did an interview with Thomas Hearns very early on in his career. And as I did with Muhammad Ali, I fell in love with this fighter who was so gracious and so uh, humble, but so great in the ring. And I admired that so much. And then when I had the opportunity to work with him and learn the sport from a different angle, not just as a fan, but actually spending time in a gym and watching what it takes to become a professional fighter. You don't play boxing. It, it is a sport, but it's a hard sport, one-on-one, -on -one, and you have to put so much into it. And I have so much respect for the people that do that, men or women, that take that sport on. I was watching TV one day, and Muhammad Ali came on TV, and he started boxing, and he went out there and was just saying all kinds of stuff and beating his man, beating his opponent up. And I thought that was that was nice. That was, that was special. That was different. Becoming the first man in boxing history to win titles and and seven different divisions. Uh, that's a, that's a big achievement myself. And and then win all the titles that I won. Uh, um, that was. Um, Winning titles is not an easy thing to do. The state of Michigan, that's our bragging rights. Other than, you know, baseball or anything, we won more championships than all sports in boxing. You know, and everybody else, you only know Tommy Hearns, that's all. There's more champions than Tommy Hearns. And I are in the 80s with Crunk, with Tommy Hearns, John McKinney, you know. We, I thought we was, we were rougher than a lot. I mean, I mean, I mean it's a stick that, come that we was rougher than a lot of people. We, when you fought somebody from Crunk, you know they came to fight. And from Detroit, Crunk, they came to fight. My uh, great uncle box, my uncle box, my brother box. So by the age of four, I was introduced to boxing just early at that age, like, er, that's an early age, right? So I know boxing, uh, I remember four, uh, my brother doing 100 push-ups, me working out with my brother, five, six, seven. Uh, my uncle, he was involved with the uh, Crunk gym around that era was Thomas Hearns, Milt McCorry, Stephen Corey, part of the whole Crunk at Scott team. It was just like normal, you know, but stepping outside of Detroit, it's a big thing, it's a huge thing. I think here in the Detroit area, we've produced more world champions than any other state. All you have to do wherever you're traveling in the world, it doesn't matter whether you're in boxing or you're on vacation or whatever, and you sit down to have a sandwich or a drink and someone sits next to you and strikes up a conversation and you say, they say, where are you from? I'm from Detroit. The next question that comes out of their mouth, oh man, can you tell me about Detroit boxing? Can you tell me about the Cronk Gym? Can you tell me about James Tony? You know, that's the first thing people from out of town will ask you once you tell them that you're out, you know, you're from Detroit. I mean, we all box each other hard. We are Durrell, Tommy, Elmer, everybody that was in that area, yeah. We all box each other hard. But nobody got bragging rights on us. For me, having them guys in my, in my camp, camp at the same time I was in the gym, well, that was the best thing for me because them guys helped me become who I am. Them guys put the hard work in as well as I put the work in. Detroit gonna keep coming. Like, like Detroit is not gonna like bag up, sit down, none of that. Detroit, if they fight the best, they, they, they gonna work for it. You know what I'm saying? They ain't gonna, oh, I'm fighting the best, I don't want to. Like, whatever you put in front of them, that's what they gonna do, you know what I'm saying? They gonna fight whoever. Even win, lose, or draw, they gonna fight them. It don't matter who it is. When Detroit boxes box, they box, they, they passionate. You know, uh, literally, we go hard. Like being from Detroit, I know this is about myself. I go hard at everything I do. My work, my professional, it's something about that Detroit spirit. So it's not a negative, it's a positive. I think Detroit boxers are tough just because of the way they come up. It's an industrial city, it's a blue collar city. And I think there's a lot of young talent here. There always has been. And I think that these kids today that go into the gyms that want to fight, it's a great way to get them off the streets and it teaches them discipline, self-defense. You certainly have to be on your game if you're gonna fight. You're not on a team, it's just one against one. And Detroit's been known to have tremendous talent. 
Being involved in, with the Metro Detroit Golden Gloves, I was able to see on a national level Detroit and boxing. Detroit is just a whole, we, we, just, we have a whole different vibe. It's, it's different. So it's unexplainable. I can explain it. I think it's just the spirit of Detroit. It was very uplifting to come to the Golden Gloves this year and see how that, how much uh, the new officers have brought up the organization over the last few years. I'm very, very proud of the work that they've done. And uh, I, I see in the future, if this is going to happen, that uh, we're going to go back to the old days where we used to have two or three rings with uh, two or three bouts going on at the same time. One of the things back here, you go back to the 70s and the 80s where Detroit boxing was dominant in the world. And the reason for that was we had a great amateur program. And from the amateurs, they were going into the pros. And I see a, a rejuvenation of that happening. I see a great amateur program that's going on right now. And it's just a matter of time before they go into the pros. And I think in the next five years, uh, Detroit boxing will be dominant on the world boxing scene again. Boxing is what made Muhammad Ali famous. And he used his stature in sports to speak out against injustice, racial inequality, and religious bias. When his career ended, Ali became an international symbol of freedom and courage. It took hard work, discipline, persistence, and talent for Ali to achieve everything that he did, both in and out of the boxing ring. And these are some of the same attributes that young people learn here at the Downtown Boxing Gym. The nonprofit organization combines athletics and academics in a free after-school program for kids ages 8 to 18. I sat down with the founder, Kelly Sweeney, to talk about how the Downtown Boxing Gym provides kids with the tools they need to succeed in life. Kelly Sweeney, it is always good to see you. Welcome back to American Black Journal. Thanks for having me back. Yeah. So let's start for people who may not know anything about the Downtown Boxing Gym uh, with you explaining what goes on here. So um, we pick up the kids from school or home uh, at no cost. We, we have our own transportation. Uh, we bring them to the gym. Um, they come in and they go to the designated area, which may be reading, which may be uh, math, computer, or whatever we may have going on. It could be something as, as like a financial literacy course may be going on, or it could be a cooking class going on. So they, they find the designated areas where they should be, and they go to those areas, our science class, our, our homeroom class, and stuff like that. And after they get finished with that, they go into our uh, sports and wellness part of the, the program, which is, um, you know, uh, Boxing, yeah. basketball, Boxing, right. <laughs> lacrosse, hockey, whatever that sport may be for the day. Yeah. And so that's pretty much how it goes. Yeah. And, and talk about that link between the work that the kids do here and the play, the, the activity. That's a, that's a big part of what makes this a special place. So here, the, the, the motto is books before boxing. That's our motto, books before boxing. And that's before anything. Uh, education has to be plan A, not plan B. You know, education is your plan A, it's not your backup plan. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, take, we take pride in making sure that our academic uh, thing is first and foremost. So you have to, um, we test our, our youth uh, quarterly to make sure where they are, make sure they, they're not behind grade level, make sure they're where they should be or above. And we make sure they go through those, those uh, sections, like I said before, uh, reading, math, anything else they might need help with. And from that point on, now it's about having a healthy body. Now your mind is strong. Now we need to make your body your body strong to go go along with that mind, mm -hmm. and so we do uh, sports sampling, uh, exercise. You know, just regular general push ups, sit ups, and the whole uh, calisthenics routine. Yeah. yeah. And of course, we got a couple boxers. Right. <laughs> a couple. A couple. <laughs> a, couple. a couple. A couple boxers. Uh, I, I've always thought that this was such a personal uh, project for you, and uh, something that grew out of your own experiences. Talk about what led you to the idea that this is what the city's young people needed. Um, it was my own experience. You know, I went through Detroit Public School. I never learned how to read and write, but I was still passed from grade to grade. And um, throughout my years, I found out that a lot of guys that I grew up with and young women could not read or write, yet they made it to the 12th grade and graduated. And, you know, some people went off to college and came back home from, of course, they couldn't keep up. But um, you know, I ended up dropping out early on because I realized that, like, I can't read or write, I need to do something because nobody was inspiring me. Nobody was telling me anything positive. It was always, you're gonna be dead in jail before you're 21. 
Nobody said, hey, man, what's really going on? What's the reason why you can't focus in class? What's the reason that you're acting out? And from the third grade on, it's like, you know, I was just being kicked out of school or passed along. And so when I made the choice to change my life, um, after uh, my brother pointed out to me that there's nothing but death and destruction in your neighborhood, there's no resources in your community, um, I decided to make a choice. And I was like, man, you know, what is it that I want to do? Because he asked me, he said, what do you want to do with your life? And I had to answer that, that simple question. I was like, man, what do I want to do? And the only thing that I could think of was I wanted to learn how to read. You know, just not knowing how to read, you're always hiding in the shadows. You're always behind, you know, hoping somebody don't find you out. And so um, I went back to school and, you know, tried my best to learn in school. But, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a hard road. Yeah. It was tough. Yeah. Uh, when you see the kids who come here today, uh, do you think of yourself? Of course. Of yeah. course. I see myself in every kid that walks through the door. I mean, you know, um, a lot of guys are dealing with issues nobody know. And through, through sports, we can actually find out what's going on because in that hour of play, you can find out more about a person than a lifetime of questions. So when you're playing and laughing and joking and having fun, you can ask some of the critical questions and they'll be willing to answer you because you're here every single day. Yeah. And I make sure that I'm here every single day. I make sure that these doors are open every day that we're supposed to be open. And, and the kids come here and they, they, they feel home, they feel welcome, they feel like a part of a family. And we mentor it by giving our testimony and what's going, what happened through our lives and how they can avoid some of the pitfalls that we fell into. Yeah. So. Um, when, you, uh, when you started this, uh, where were the kids before? What were they doing before there was the downtown boxing gym? Well, um, in the community where I first started the gym, I mean, it was roughly around 30% of the kids in that neighborhood was graduating from high school and about 70% were dropping out. And so, I mean, you can just understand, you, you know what was going on, you know, if, if, if there's nothing for a kid to do, he will find something to do right. or it'll find him right. or it'll find him or her. And so I picked the neighborhood and the location and I, and I, moved, I came into that location and I, and I let it be known clear right out the bat that it was my way or no way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's books before everything. Mm -hmm. And so when kids came in that program, they understood that and they started getting the results and then it just was word of mouth and it started spreading. And so we get kids from all over. So, so we've just experienced this incredible disruption for a year and a half during uh, the pandemic, and I am asking everybody uh, how, they, how they manage that. I'm particularly curious about the kids here and how you were able to maybe help them uh, get through what was a, a difficult time for everybody. Um, yeah, um, you know, we, we, heard, we, had the, we heard the news about the shutdown uh, Friday, uh, I can't think of what the exact date, but it was on a Friday, and by Monday we were back up and running. Mm -hmm. We were actually going virtual. We were we were completely virtual. Um, we 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 sent home computers. We sent home PPE. We our staff started uh, developing curriculum. We started sending the curriculum home to the children because, I mean, you know, we didn't want them to have any backslide. Yeah. You know, you get summer slide, but you don't want to have a whole year of slide, yeah. and you'll get so far behind. And so we found out that a lot of kids just had access to to cell phones and cell phones couldn't uh, access a lot of the, 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 the apps that they needed to do for school. Yeah. So we made sure that we, through our partners and, and our team, we got together and made sure all the kids had computers. And we, like I said, we, we not only dealt with the kids in our program, it would, it would seem like uh, a no brainer. If you're sending food home to a kid that's in the program, he has three or four brothers and sisters who may be too young for the program or too old, you have to send food home for the whole family. So we. We, we gathered our resources and we sent food home to the whole family. Wow. And the physical part of it had to go on hiatus oh, yeah. for a time. <laughs> no, it didn't. It didn't, right? No, no, it did not. <laughs> so we had virtual workouts. We were doing yeah. virtual work, uh, workouts. I was like a, like a, a infomercial. We were doing workouts <laughs> online. <laughs> but talk about the first time you were able to bring people back together uh, physically. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, that was, that was good to see people faces, you know, yeah. looking at people on the, on a TV screen is one thing, but to have them here in a facility, you know, it, it felt like a little bit of normal for me, you know what I mean? Cause we've been doing it since 2007. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, since 2007, that's a long time. Yeah. And so I wasn't used to not, I, w I wasn't used to them being physically in the building. So, yeah. so yeah. it felt good to have the kids back in the building. Yeah. Uh, so there's this new documentary coming out about uh, Muhammad Ali okay. uh, and the legacy that he leaves, not just in sport, but of course uh, in civil rights and other kinds of uh, activist uh, issues. Uh, I, I really would love to know 
what he meant to you, I mean, as a young person growing up who has been interested in boxing? So, um, I'm not necessarily a, a, a boxing fan. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily uh, follow the sport itself. Um, I love the discipline of the sport. I love what it brings to, to a, a person's uh, character, it builds character. Um, it's, it's one of those sports where you have to show character, you have to show restraint, you have to be focused, you have to have a, a, a level of dedication to even be semi-good at it. Yeah. And so I love that aspect of it. Um, so I, I didn't really follow boxing too much, but when I did have the opportunity to see boxing, and I would see somebody like Ali, he was an inspiration to people. He was an inspiration not just to people in my community, but, but to people around the world. Mm -hmm. you know. And then to hear his personal story and to hear some of the things that he did behind the scenes, he became the greatest in my eyes for his work outside of the ring. You know, that's the stuff that I, I, I like to hear. I like to hear those stories about what happens when the cameras go off. And he was a true example of what a person, a human being should do when the cameras is off. Yeah. He inspired a generation, the youth, the, the old, the disenfranchised, he inspired a lot of people. So. I mean, he, he's, I mean, he leaves a great legacy behind. Yeah. Well, and I feel like the, the downtown boxing gym is part of that legacy, right? I mean, you are not just inspiring kids to get in the ring or, or other physical activities. Yeah. It's, out, it's what they do and who they are outside of that that really matters. Yeah, yeah to, me, to me, it's like, you know, of course you're going to come across some standout kids who may be athletically gifted, mm -hmm. and that's cool. But the vast majority of people are never going to uh, throw a professional punch in their life. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. To be totally honest. Yeah. And so we have to prepare the kids for life. And so what we do here, we train kids for life. We don't, we don't train kids to fight. We train kids for life. We give them all the tools they need to be successful as human beings. And so they can give back to the community in ways that's, that's beneficial for the whole of humanity. Yeah. Uh, you guys have also developed incredible partnerships mm -hmm. uh, with all kinds of organizations. Uh, across the city. Talk about how important that is, that this is not just an outpost here on the east side. It's connected all over the city. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I tell guys this all the time. You know, when I was doing this by myself, mm -hmm. it was a heavy lift. It was really heavy. It was, it was, it was heavy. It, 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 it almost broke me. It, I mean, I ended up homeless. I went from 215, I mean, I went from 215, 218 solid muscle down to about 130 pounds, 40 pounds, roughly, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. It was uh, mentally draining, physically draining. But when I decided to open up my heart and open up my mind to, to, I'm saying it's a community thing, but I'm trying to do it by myself. And once the community was allowed to be a part of it, a lot of hands made the lifting lighter. And so we made partnerships with a lot of people that's doing a lot of great work out here in the community, uh, not just in the community, but uh, nationwide, some worldwide. And so it's, it's, part, it's, it's good to be a part of that gl uh, global community. Yeah. Did you ever believe when things were at their worst that, uh, that you would be sitting in the middle of this really impressive organization uh, that you are now? Um, to be honest and, 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 and transparent, uh, if I didn't, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. I would have gave up. Yeah. I've always saw the light at the end of the tunnel, and we're not at the end of the tunnel yet. And so I don't do any victory dances. I don't do any victory laps because a lot of work to be done. And so I want to still living this truth and keep doing what we got to do yeah, to yeah. get it done. What does the future look like around um, here? The future around here? Mm -hmm. We're in the process of uh, trying to replicate this program. You know, we want to replicate this program. We want to actually um, spread what we're doing yeah. because we, 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 we have a track record. We, we, had a, we have a 100% graduation rate um, and we want to spread that. You know, it's a lot of communities who call us all the time who ask for us to, to help them do this in their communities. And so now we're at a point where we believe that we're ready to do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to go back and have you say that again. You have a 100% graduation rate. That's just an unbelievable number in a city where we struggle so hard yeah, to get you, kids. You know, and, and I'm glad that we're able to do that with our staff. We have a great staff. You know, they don't, they don't mind if you're in the 12th grade and they need to take you back to the second grade level and work on things that you didn't get in the second grade. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no sense in pushing you forward when you don't know the basics of math or, or, or you don't even understand basic uh, reading and writing uh, techniques. So we, by us being our, we having that freedom, mm -hmm. we can gear our curriculum around the child. We can go back. You, the schools can't do that, to yeah. my knowledge. I'm yeah. not trying to down the school, but they can't do that. 
they can't start you back at the kindergarten, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we can. Right. And we have a staff that's willing to do that. Yeah. And, and you know, you say that the schools can't do that, but it seems to me there's a lesson there for them too that you don't ever give up on right. a child. That no right. matter how bad things get or how far behind they are, there's always an opportunity. I don't even I don't even know if the kids I don't even know if the schools are giving up on them. It's just like you know you have a lot of restraints, a lot of um, red tape, a lot of politics involved, a lot of things that go go along with that. We don't have that here. Yeah. We know that a kid needs help with math, so be it. We're going to help them with math. Yeah. You know, whatever that looks like. That's going to do it for us this week. Make sure you tune in to the Ken Burns documentary, Muhammad Ali, right here on Detroit Public Television, September 19th through the 22nd at 8 o'clock each night. We want to thank the Downtown Boxing Gym for having us. You can find out more about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And as always, you can connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. Take care, and we'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, Impact at Home, UAW Solidarity Forever, and viewers like you. Thank you.